Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Bilingualism and Multilingualism. This is the third week of the course and I am Dr. Ark Varma from the Cognitive Science Department at IIT Kanpur. In the last lecture, we have talked a little bit about various stages of language acquisition, mainly with a focus on first language acquisition, but also simultaneously keep uh, having a, a, an eye for how are individuals acquiring their two or three, four languages simultaneously. One of the very interesting aspects of this, uh, uh, you know, exercise of language acquisition is the chronology of how this happens and basically does this chronology have any boundary conditions. For example, uh, are the developmental milestones that we discussed, for example, in Kohl's 2003, uh, you know, description of what happens at what age for these children, are these milestones really watertight or are they overlapping with each other or say, for example, if a child misses these milestones, what are the consequences for that? All of these debates in some sense are gathered around a particular very influential hypothesis in the field of language learning, which is known as the critical period hypothesis for language learning. In today's lecture and the lecture after this, I am going to sort of uh, take a detailed look at this critical period hypothesis, uh, basically with a view to understanding is there a critical period at all that limits or let us say gives a uh, sort of a boundary condition for language learning. In today's lecture, I will talk more about the critical period in terms of first language acquisition, whereas in tomorrow's lecture, I am going to talk a little bit more in detail about whether there are critical, where, whether there can be a critical period or let us say age of acquisition kind of effects in second language learning. Let us begin. Now, the critical period hypothesis, uh, you know, as Birdsong uh, aptly summarizes, is basically uh, to the tune that uh, there is a limited developmental period during which it is possible for individuals to acquire a language, whether it is their L1 or their L2, to normal or native-like levels. What is native-like level? I will come to that and I will talk about that as well. But the idea is that this is a biological or intellectual sort of, uh, you know, it's it's mainly housed in a biological argument which basically says that once this window of opportunity is passed, the ability to learn languages steadily declines over time time and in some sense a consequence of this hypothesis would be that while children will be very good, children are in fact very good at picking up languages, uh, you know, very swiftly, uh, the ability to pick up new languages, learn new languages apparently should diminish or does diminish with when people of, you know, growing age. Say for example, the older you get, the harder it becomes for you to grasp another language. Now, is this, is this actually true? Should we sort of look around ourselves, uh, have a look at particular examples and do we find that this is actually the case? This is something I would invite you to ponder upon uh, because if that is, then there must be either biological or intellectual cognitive factors that might be governing this. The critical period hypothesis, as I just said, is more of a biological hypothesis that basically, uh, you know, is in line with Chomsky and ideas of innate language specific learning capabilities uh, rather than actual factors, uh, you know, which are housed in cognitive theories or functional descriptions. So, the critical and also in, in one of the, se in one sense, if you look at the critical period hypothesis, you might look at it as a summation of the general notion that acquiring new skills, any skills, be it language or otherwise, gets progressively more difficult with age. Even if you were to learn driving or swimming at a later age, let us say you decided to go to learn swimming at the age of 40, 45, 50 maybe, uh, it is that much harder for an individual to learn swimming at a, at that age rather than if the individual was learning to swim, let us say at 3, 4, 5 years of age. More specifically, uh, you know, if you look at this in more detail, you would find that some forms of skill learning may require very specific 
stimulation say for example if you want to learn uh, gymnastics uh, you know a particular kind of training is required if you want to learn uh, uh, speaking a particular language a particular kind of training is required uh, Although when I am talking about first language acquisition, there is typically not really uh, explicit language instruction that uh, parents engage in, but there is obviously that particular kind of input that is required for individuals to learn language. Okay. Uh, interestingly, people have uh, reasoned that this training or this exposure to this uh, external stimulation must happen within a particular bounded period of time within which its effects are most optimal uh, and out of which the effects are slightly uh, you know, less effective for that matter. Say for example, if somebody were to uh, take uh, swimming classes, uh, uh, you know, uh, every day. The swimming classes every day that you take at the age of 3 or 4 years might be more helpful than if you take the same kinds of swimming classes every day at the age of 45, 50, 55 and so on. So, the same kind of stimulation works better when it happens within a particular bounded period of time versus if it works outside that bounded period of time. Let us take an example. The songbird chaffinch uh, must be exposed to the male song of its uh, species within 10 to 15 days of its birth, otherwise it would not be able to develop the similar singing skill. Similarly, with ducks, I am sure you would know say, that ducklings need to be imprinted or say for example, need to be attached to their uh, mother immediately after birth, otherwise what would happen is that they would attach themselves, they would have this irrevocable sort of attachment with any moving object or things that they would, you know, come across, uh, you know, minutes after birth. It could be, uh, you know, even a crocodile, uh, you know, floor, uh, uh, swimming around in the river or let us say a twig or any other thing for that matter. So, there are instances in nature where, uh, uh, you know, there is this need for a time bound stimulation and the, uh, if this stimulation does not happen with a time bound period, it leads to semi permanent uh, changes, I will not call them irreversible, but semi permanent changes that would happen with the biology, uh, you know, of the, of the uh, individual in question. So, the critical period hypothesis for language learning therefore has been favored for uh, by experts from linguistics, psychology, neuroscience, foreign language teaching and even policy makers. You could see some of the policies that exist in our schools, uh, some of the things that we sort of talk about even in the new education policy for example, there is a lot of stress on teaching a lot of skills very early in life. There is a lot of stress on what kinds of skills need to be imparted at what age because in some sense the uh, idea is to allow the uh, cognitive and biological capabilities of an individual uh, with the kind of, uh, kind of pedagogical uh, you know instructions that they are being imparted with. Interestingly, the critical period hypothesis comes in various shapes and forms, uh, one of which basically is made uh, by uh, let us say uh, you know Penfield who says that the superior language learning skills of young children is due to the higher plasticity of brain, the higher brain plasticity that is available to younger children as opposed to older individuals. And uh, he goes on to say that this higher plasticity is because when you are growing uh, you know at early ages uh, diminishes because at later ages, uh, the myelination of the uh, you know neurons is finally complete, and new, no uh, and fewer new connections can be formed, and etc. etc. This is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it was put forward by Lenberg in 1967, who says that you know the critical period of language learning basically has something to do with the progressive lateralization of the brain. So the idea is the brain is maturing; it is uh, you know it is sort of. Uh, reaching its uh, eventual uh, final developmental stages by the age of 8, 9 years and this is around the time where the brain is also getting lateralized. Later, what does lateralization mean? Uh, just to give you a brief uh, recap from some of the earlier lectures that I may have taken, lateralization basically refers to a relative uh, uh, specialization of either of the two hemispheres for a particular skill. In, in our case, it is very uh, well linked to the left hemisphere because the left hemisphere of the brain is supposed to be specialized for language functions, whereas the right hemisphere of the brain is supposed to be specialized for non-language functions, vision, emotion, those kind of things. Now, Lenneberg basically says that our brain starting from birth is getting progressively lateralized every, uh, you know, with every passing day because of the new information it is getting and one of the key drivers of this lateralization or, uh, you know, in, in that sense is the lateralization towards the left hemisphere for language and towards the right hemisphere for other non-verbal activities. 
Lennebuck basically says that around birth, both the hemispheres are equipotential. However, as a consequence of maturation that, that is growing with age, lateralization, uh, you know, is in some sense getting culminated gradually and during this process the left hemisphere sort of becomes more and more specialized for language. Now uh, I mean this in, in some sense you can say uh, call this as a culmination of the maturational period as well or the culmination of the lateralization process as well. The uh, sum total of that is that by the time these two processes are complete the left hemisphere should be uh, should have already become specialized for speech whereas right hemisphere for non-verbal functions. They are linking this to the critical, critical period hypothesis in a way that once the literalization or the maturational process is complete, uh, newer skills, especially language is harder to come by, is more, much more harder to learn because whatever inputs that the brain had to take during this literalization for language uh, was happening is already assumed complete by that time. If something happens after this, it will delay that entire process or it will make it that much more harder for the brain to pick up these new skills. So, the progress of uh, uh, lateralization or the progress of lateralization as uh, you know the an individual is growing up uh, is also supposed to be in, uh, accompanied by the decreased plasticity of the brain which in some sense uh, basically uh, you know according to some biological uh, researchers uh, culminates at around puberty. So, around 10, 11 years which is where the critical period also ends and basically uh, what we are now saying is that by the end of pu pu puberty, by the end of the period that the brain is uh, reached its uh, you know uh, penultimate or ultimate stages of maturation, lateralization is complete, myelination is complete, plasticity is limited and these are you know a bunch of biological explanations that people have put forward in order to explain uh, you know the so called diminished ability of older people in learning new languages. Now is that really the case we can sort of you know uh, zoom in and look more closely at the evidence that there is. Before we move on to individual cases, another supporting idea for the notion of this critical period is the relatively better recovery of language functions in children uh, in co children compared to adults following brain damage uh, due to an injury. So it has also been observed, a lot of neuropsychologists have observed and reported this that uh, when an individual suffers from brain, inju brain injury, supposedly to the left uh, hemispheric areas of the brain which are supposed to be specialized for language. Uh, the Younger children actually uh, recover from that much earlier and uh, you know the recovery is more, uh, more uh, is, is better it is uh, you know uh, as compared to when older people sort of have a brain injury let us say have a stroke or something they do not seem to fully recover from the effects of that injury and this basically happens uh, you know owing to the higher plasticity of the uh, brain of these younger children. So, for example, if, if a younger child uh, suffers from an uh, accident and areas of the left hemisphere are damaged, what would typically happen is that because the brain is still maturing and the activity in the brain's maturation is, is still going on, uh, other surrounding areas of the uh, brain uh, surrounding the damaged areas uh, sort of take up the language functions. All right. So, this is again something that uh, has to do uh, again with this uh, higher plasticity in younger brains as opposed to older brains and so on. Finally, the idea of a critical period as I said earlier as well is supported by Chomsky's proposal of the universal grammar or a species specific language learning device. And the idea is that it's species specific language learning device uh, basically works upon the input that it is receiving from the environment to allow us to learn language. Once the uh, you know the brain has reached its maturational uh, uh, you know uh, stage or once the progressive lateralization is complete, it basically happens that this language learning device if it has not received any input during these early years uh, you know of an individual's life, uh, this language learning capability or whatever the neural basis of this language learning capability is, it veers off, it gets destroyed, it gets diminished and its ability to allow us to learn and pick up several new languages also fades away and goes away. So, the idea is it is the time, it is very time specific, it is very time sensitive that individuals get the proper linguistic input and the proper environment to learn a language within this specific bounded period of time because this will allow them to learn language to the best uh, probable extent that they can as opposed to if this uh, simulation uh, arrives slightly later in life when uh, all of these three processes, uh, you know, prog myelination, progressive uh, uh, lateralization, maturation have completed. 
So, in, in some sense so far we have seen that the critical period hypothesis is actually uh, more of a biological hypothesis that sets us our, uh, aside uh, conditions uh, within which language learning can happen and after which language learning becomes increasingly more difficult. Now, let us look at you know age of acquisition effects for the first language you know what really happens depending upon when the individuals pick up language typically for most of us it happens that we are acquiring uh, you know input uh, related to language since birth or if you remember the previous lecture n minus 3 months after birth which is when our auditory systems have already developed now uh, children uh, and it happens it has been reported in some very rare cases that children who have not been exposed to somehow uh, to rich linguistic input since birth have eventually been found to uh, you know have restricted linguistic development going forward. And interestingly these children offer us a very interesting opportunity uh, in terms of studying language acquisition and its breakdowns uh, whenever you know this really uh, takes place. Uh, there are different types of scenarios where these kind of cases have been discovered. Uh, typically, it has happened, uh, you know, typically these people, these children have been referred to as feral children, uh, basically children who are reared in the wild or grew up in the wild, reared by wild animals. And there are two or three categories of these kind of children that, uh, you know, have been documented and we are going to talk about them. Firstly, children who are deserted in the wild and have been supposedly raised by animals such as wolves or monkeys and so on and so forth. An interesting case of this type was that of uh, two girls uh, found in Midnapur in India uh, back in the 1920s called Kamla and Amla. Uh, Kamla was around 6 to 8 years when discovered, Amla was around 4 to 6 years when discovered, they were both discovered in a wolf's den and were taken to an orphanage by, that, by a missionary named Joseph Singh who start who immediately put them on language training and you know other kind of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, behavioral training that is uh, expected of girls of this age now interestingly these girls were being apparently being raised by the wolves now kamala the older kid who's probably already passed this critical period that we are talking about after 3 years of training could master only about 40 words you know something that a normal 2 year old could probably master within a week or a fewer days all right and even though whatever words she was learning were and when she would try to speak them would be phonologically under specified the details the phonemes would not be as uh, you know uh, uh, presented in that much detail as opposed to uh, you know even for example compared to a 2 year or a 3 year normal developing child. Kamala died at the age of 16 due to typhoid infection and although the younger sister Amala who was basically uh, you know. Uh, making slightly better progress than Kamala given that she was still in this critical period uh, you know that uh, we have uh, talked about. Uh, she also fell ill very very quickly and died within a year of being discovered. So again while there is some trend of the importance of critical period the evidence is not really conclusive. So we can go to another type of feral children that have been discovered it could be something those say for example uh, there is a case of this boy called victor uh, you know from avron uh, near, you know avron forest near the uh, near the city of toulouse in france victor was discovered at the age of 12 years and was trained by jean marc itard who was a medical student at that time uh, interestingly, you can note that uh, uh, Victor has also been discovered post the uh, you know critical period and what happens is that even after 5 years of rigorous training, uh, uh, you know Victor showed almost zero progress with respect to learning language and the only couple of words that he could actually master eventually were O oh, Dieu basically meaning O oh, God or lay which is milk. So, n other than that the child has not been able to pick up anything uh, because probably he was discovered after the critical period had already passed. Finally, a third category of such children whose behavior resembles that of feral, feral children, but they have not been raised in a wild environment, but let us say within the human familial environment, but have been kept devoid of any kind of linguistic input or human interaction. For instance, say for example, some of these children that we could talk about uh, were actually kept confined to a room, a cellar, 
kept logged, not allowed to speak, not allowed to hear any kind of linguistic input. And then when they were discovered and uh, rescued, uh, their language abilities at that time were assessed and then it was also assessed that okay, how did they improve with human contact, with better living conditions and so on and so forth. A very interesting case uh, of, su of such a kind is that of Oksana Malaya, who was a Ukrainian girl who spent the life, who spent her life between 3 to 8 years of age in a dog kennel behind her house. So, she was basically somehow deserted by her parents and she spent three to the time of 3 to 8 years in her life in a dog kennel just behind her house. Uh, when she was discovered, she was found to be, uh, you know, her behaviors were found to be resembling that of dogs. She would walk on all fours, she would uh, bark, growl, sniff at her food and so on and so forth. Interestingly, if you type Oxana Malaya on YouTube, you will be able to find a very long sort of uh, one, one or two hour uh, documentary uh, that sort of describes her and you will see that it's it's very interesting that by this time uh, you know when this documentary is made she has actually uh, uh, gained a bunch of language functions which probably were not there uh, when these tests were being conducted so uh, oxana also could not learn language to the you know to any significant con uh, extent uh, because when she was discovered she was already past what uh, is referred to as a critical period final notable case in this uh, uh, you know in this category or in this variety uh, could be that of the girl called Jeannie who was discovered in 1970 in a Los Angeles suburb. Now Jeannie was kept in a linguistically impoverished environment from the age of around 20 months to 13 years. She had been kept locked up in a room tied to a potty chair uh, with no uh, you know permission to make any kinds of noises or even uh, the input of any kind of human uh, uh, conversation was sort of very very minimal almost non-existent for her all right uh, her father was obviously uh, you know uh, had some kind of uh, mental issues and he could not tolerate any noises so Jeannie was not allowed to make any sounds moreover the household was also completely quiet she was rescued around the age of 12 or 13 and once rescued she was first moved to a child's hospital where the only speech uh, she could produce were words like stop it, no more or sorry, probably arising from you know her predicament in, uh, in, in that particular place. Now, uh, Jeannie was uh, in some sense uh, or her training was undertaken by Victor Fromkin, a psycholinguistic from UCLA uh, and uh, her stu and his uh, graduate student Susan Curtis uh, who basically tried to rehabilitate Jeannie and uh, uh, you know help her grasp uh, aspects of intelligence uh, uh, as well as aspects of language as well. Now, uh, according to Curtis's records, uh, within four years of her rescue, Jeannie clearly attained most of the aspects of operational intelligence, including uh, that of uh, you know a figurative thought. Uh, moreover, she could also demonstrate fully developed and superior abilities in the domain of visual and spatial function. So, some of these aspects of you know children being intelligent is were very evident, were pretty apparent in Jeannie. However, when you read Susan Curtis's reports, it basically tells us that the linguistic repertoire of uh, Jeannie uh, was slightly atypical. Atypical in the sense that although within uh, you know few months of her discovery, she had begun to produce single words. Couple of months later, she had acquired a productive vocabulary about of 100 to 200 words and had also started to combine words. The development of morphological and uh, syntactic aspects of language were slightly impoverished. Uh, according to the earlier reports, Jeannie could not pick up comparable development of morphology and uh, you know syntax uh, such as tenses, word order, affixes, uh, you know also things like prepositions, auxiliary verbs, uh, you know I will do this, I will do that and so on and so forth. And uh, this basically led the researchers to believe that while Jeannie is being able to at least uh, understand word meanings which is basically a referential lexical knowledge. she's typically being able to pick up what a word means, say for example, this is a pen, this is a watch and so on. She was being able to do that, but she was not being able to master aspects of grammar, which basically tells us maybe this critical period uh, talks more about the development of syntactical capabilities rather than picking up semantic relations uh, from the conceptual environment. And the researchers actually, actually published a bunch of papers uh, documenting Jeannie's uh, prowess in language learning and so on and so forth. However, 
uh, years later, probably uh, you know a couple uh, couple of decades later, when this data was relooked at, and a lot of researchers sort of went back and started uh, looking at this data, it was discovered that actually Jeannie was progressing rather well. She was able to pick up a bunch of aspects of a syntax as well as morphology, and what probably was happening was that due to some kind of an experimenter's bias, uh, some of those aspects were being ignored by the experimenters or being treated as fluke or being treated as something that she has just done by chance and will not be able to replicate later. So, this here is a very interesting case of you know experimenters and scientists uh, being in some sense slightly uh, you know restricted in their vision or interpretation by the idea that they already have. Obviously, Fromkin and uh, Curtis probably uh, believed more in the critical period hypothesis, which may have led to, you know, some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a harsher interpretation of uh, Jeannie's linguistic skills than was basically warranted by her linguistic behavior. Because a, a lot of la later research actually talks about the fact that Jeannie did eventually pick up some aspects of grammar and, uh, you know, morphology. Uh, which were obviously overlooked by these earlier researchers. So, to summarize, the critical period hypothesis seems to be able to predict a period of optimal learning for the first language, which is let us say within this bound of critical period till puberty or up to 8, 9 years and so on. However, the evidence uh, for individuals, you know, who have missed this critical period is actually rather hard to take into account. Even if you talk about Kamala and Amla or Victor or Jeannie or Oksana, uh, all of these evidences are uh, slightly under documented. A bunch of these things uh, may get confounded by experimenters bias, a uh, bunch of these things uh, basically. So, because we cannot really create an experiment around this, we cannot actively control for all conditions and keep somebody isolated without linguistic input for any length of time, uh, a bunch of these things are not really testable and demonstrable in that sense. So, the evidence for the critical period hypothesis, although it is part of folklore and common wisdom these days and has always been, uh, the part of the evidence for the critical period hypothesis, uh, especially for first language acquisition looks sketchy at best, alright. So, in the next lecture, I will talk about some of the related effects of critical period or age of acquisition for second language learning in bilinguals and multilinguals. Thank you so much.